It's getting way too nasty in here. We gotta stop. What's going on, fellas? I'm back again messing with this damn torch. Basically, what it comes down to is, as I said, I didn't put it all the way together for a reason. Um, one of the hard things about putting one of these cells together is you'd never quite know how tight you have to have the bolts. There's no book that you can just open up and says torque to this specification, you know? So you kind of just kind of throw it together, shoot for a tar target gap that you're looking for. I, in particularly, was going for the optimum two millimeter gap. But things started to get a little tight and I became concerned I might be over tightening things unnecessarily. I didn't want to start stripping the nuts and all that. So I've been back to work for this week, working back out at the power plant, doing an outage, doing some very long hours. Come home and found this little puddle on the floor. Turns out I got a little bit of a weep in the face of my cell. You can't see it from here, but that's one of the tricky parts about building these things. You don't want to put it together all the way until you've leak proofed it. Typically, I would do what's called a breadboard configuration when I'm designing or building something like this, which is a common term engineers use for a laid out construction. Everything is laid out in an easily accessible configuration so that if a problem's encountered, it can be easily fixed. I avoided that step and consequently, I am now going to have to take this thing apart a little bit. Well, I know why it's leaking. I should have done the breadboard first. I failed to do that and this is the consequence. Watch how loose this bolt is now. <laughs> it was not that loose so she has loosened up significantly i'm gonna go ahead and compress this thing down to two millimeters per plate gap uh, i'm gonna try and do that without opening this thing up i better close that having that close causes the induced vacuum from the leak to actually stop the leak from happening i would imagine the leak is in fact coming from that face plate right there because it's just not a very good seal there's so much surface area on that seal that hopefully that's the problem with it then again i did glue that side so at any rate i'm gonna go ahead looks like i've got the room to tighten this thing up a little bit so let's see what happens luckily i didn't finish the job completely because then i would have really been screwed i might be able to get away with just removing the side panel I should be able to access those bolts. These bolts on the face just have to be held in place. And uh, the ones we want to turn are the nuts themselves. We don't want to turn these ones because they're welded. They're basically just a bolt and we don't want to be spinning that dielectric. We don't want to scar that up and um, get it to contact metal. So essentially what I'm going to do, I'm thinking it's going to be very hard to measure this thing now that it's in place, but I have to disconnect the anchor points of the cell on one side so that I can um, tighten this baby up. I'm, I'm probably going to go ahead and um, give them a full turn, maybe more. I might even go ahead and bring it down to the two millimeters, but the problem is, is we got I kind of need to inspect the leak because if a bunch of electrolyte leaked out into that plexiglass, plate that you see down there under the cell that plate is holding those electrolyzer plates in place so that they're not just bear, bearing load by the um, compression I did not like the thought of that at any rate if a massive leak did get up under there and I now have electrical contact between the plates that could interfere with performance it wouldn't inhibit the cell from operating but it could definitely cause problems. A thin membrane of uh, electrolyte that small can only propagate at maximum 30 watts of electricity. I've done plenty of experimentation that proves this. I actually filled a tube up like this, full of electrolyte, 
and then use this very diode setup to pass 120 volts of electricity through that tube. The tube was about from here to here. And I think the maximum wattage, I actually have the data on that. It's in this book somewhere. I'll try and find it and put it on there. This is one of my first um, engineering diaries, so it's not very well kept. Somewhere in here is that information that tells us, I'm pretty sure it was like 80 watts, was the max power at 120 volts. Okay, so here it is. Forgive me, this is very old. This was when I was very sloppy in my work. Basically what I did was built a salt bridge consisting of a 3 8 plastic tube, two feet long. And I connected it in between two beakers. And these beakers were full of electrolyte. Um, you can kind of pause this if you want to read my sloppy writing. I'm not going to bore you with reading it. But essentially what it comes down to is 133 watts was the most electricity I was able to transport through this tube. So two foot, you're looking about from here to here. 130 watts is the maximum amount of electricity that will pass from one point of this tube to the other using 107 volts DC as I believe is the most I was even able to push through it. Okay, so the best way I can describe what we're doing here at this point with this cell would be normalizing the cell. We brought it up to about 136 degrees and after doing so the gas gets normalized, I guess we'll call it and the bolts became loose. I could turn that wrench with my pinky finger. So now I've tightened them up as far as the, um, that lower dielectric shim will allow us. That shim basically keeps the plates from touching the steel bolts. I didn't want to trust some type of wrap on that. And um, the size of that shim basically only enabled me to tighten the cell up an additional five millimeters.
literally boils fire brick. Most flames can't boil fire brick. Oh, here it is. It literally turns fire brick into to glass. Only an arc can do this usually. Check that out. 